And Kavork, uh, maybe I could welcome you to the program at this point and, and see what your thoughts are. Because, I mean, what we've got to keep in mind is that Libya, up until the bombing in 2011, was basically had probably the best uh, infrastructure, as uh, certainly the best water infrastructure in North in the whole of North Africa. And, and what we did effectively by bombing the country, as we did at the time, was to bomb it back into the Stone Age. So there was no question that, 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 that with the be- even with the best will in the world, uh, Libya as a country was going to be able to um, maintain the infrastructure to a level that was that w- would be ne- necessary. Actually, I was reading an article today on uh, the Irish Times, and they also say that uh, human errors uh, exaggerated or contributed in the deaths of a lot of people in Libya because there was no competent reaction uh, before and after this disaster that happened in, in Libya. But the, it's so disingenuous to see that a lot of uh, mainstream outlets aren't even mentioning the real cause of the chaos in, in Libya. They say there are human errors and they say that Libya uh, is now in internal infighting and the infrastructure is destroyed. But the root cause of this uh of this misery in Libya is because of NATO's intervention in 2011. And uh, the other day, a few days ago, I was sitting with the spokesperson for Gaddafi here in Berlin, and the stories that he told me are goes go in parallel with uh, lots of stories that we heard and we documented in Syria. It was a very dirty war against Libya, against the Libyan people, for them being an advanced, developed country uh, progressive in one way or another in, in the northern African continent. And um, Africa was an example to show uh, the Africans that uh, the, the the people in the continent do not need the uh, so-called humanitarian aid, the so-called assistance that uh, many Western governments brag about on social media platforms day and night. Libya can be self-sufficient, can govern themselves. But when you destroy a centralized government and you fragment the country on three different lines and you insult two or three different governments and parliaments in one country, of course, this would be the, uh, the, one of the results of what could have happened. For example, when Vanessa mentioned Al-Tabka airbase, the United States refused to acknowledge that they bombed Al-Tabka, uh, uh, sorry, water dam. And uh, but even even the New York Times acknowledged that they were the members of top secret U.S. special operations unit called Task Force Nine. Those are the ones who uh, detonated uh, Syria's uh, Top Gadam, and they were very close uh, to causing a huge humanitarian disaster. Again, they they could have ended up by murdering tens of thousands of people in in Syria, but they. Um, uh, uh, Fortunately, this uh, plan was uh, was failed. But in Libya nowadays, I would say the media is very, very dishonest with the people by simply not even mentioning that the current situation in Libya and the uh, why the state institutions are paralyzed, why there is uh, all this chaos and infighting and the infrastructure is destroyed. The moment they point their finger to the um, to the source of the wound. Everybody will understand that NATO was not um, a force of peace in Libya and North Africa. Yes, thank you very much for that. And let's just bring uh, one example of that because we've got uh, this tweet uh, that Vanessa sent over to me uh, earlier. And Vanessa, uh, uh, Nina is saying here, it's so enjoyable. The BBC got slapped with a community note about Libya. This is on Twitter or X, uh, of course. As you can see, their coverage mentions Libya's former prosperity and the current uh, devastation, but conveniently leaves out the cause of the status change, uh, the utter destruction uh, of the 2011 intervention by everyone's favorite, ever so defensive alliance, NATO. And uh, so I thought that was uh, quite appropriate that uh, uh, Twitter had put that notice on and a bit of revenge, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you know, the BBC deserves it. And and as you've all pointed out, the majority of the media is conveniently leaving out um, the, the NATO member state damage. Let's move on then. And uh, well, we're going to talk about Armenia for a second. Now, uh, Vanessa mentioned this last week. Before we get started, I just thought we should uh, bring the map on screen and uh, give everybody an idea of the area that we're talking about here. So 
Uh, obviously, the red area is Russia. Uh, but if we zoom in on Armenia in blue there and Azerbaijan uh, to the right hand side of it in green, uh, this is the area that we're talking about. Um, and uh, well, over the last week, uh, we're seeing uh, headlines like this appearing in the mainstream press is Armenia turning to the West. So this is from uh, Wednesday uh, in uh, Radio Free Europe. We all know what Radio Free Europe is, uh, but they're to saying that for centuries, Armenians have had a tight relationship with Russia, but those ties have come under strain over the past year and a half as Russia bogged down in Ukraine, has largely stood aside uh, as its Armenian ally faces ever increasing pressure from Azerbaijan. Uh, and this narrative is even appearing in the Russian press. Uh, so this is a TASS, a TASS article, uh, Pashinyan, uh, changing countries' politics to align with the West, according to experts. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, welcome, uh, sorry, sorry, Stephanie, I want to welcome Kavork uh, back on screen uh, and uh, just get some uh, a view of from you about these headlines that are appearing, Kavork, and uh, uh, and let's see where that takes us in terms of conversation. Actually, while uh, the world can see the shift uh, in the balance of power in favor of uh, Russia and China, an increasing number of countries are joining uh, the BRICS uh, economic uh, bloc and uh, other, I would say, security architectures in uh, Eurasia, such as the CSTO, such as the Shanghai Corporation uh, Organization, um, unfortunately, in 2018, um, just like in Georgia and in Ukraine, there was a, a USA NED Soros-backed color revolution in Armenia, which brought um, a journalist uh, who used to write in uh, yellow newspapers. We call it yellow newspapers uh, because uh, they um, highly rely on uh, controversial clickbait information just to uh, create hype in the society. So he wasn't even, Pashinyan wasn't even a real journalist, in my opinion. He uh, comes to power after huge, I would say, media support to the NGOs in uh, Armenia that are funded by USAID, NED, and George Soros. And the moment he came to power, I warned the Armenians that Armenia will start uh, shifting toward the West, and it was called the conspiracy theory. And uh, today we can see the result of this color revolution. And that is Pashinyan is now doing uh, an, a very clear and uh, pub uh, pu publicly declared U-turn toward uh, the West, and he invited uh, American forces to uh, Armenia for joint uh, training with the uh, Armenian forces, although all the hardware technology of the Armenian forces are from Russia. All types of, the, the, the Armenia doesn't have any sort of weaponry from the United States. It's all from either from the Soviet era or from Russia. I'm not saying that uh, Armenia should be a client state for uh, for Russia or for the United States, but what I'm, I'm, I can clearly see that this is a self-harming uh, policy. Armenia is shooting uh, to its own leg uh, by this new turn, because in my opinion, the interest of Armenia is to have a strategic friendship with Russia, at the same time to have a good trade relationship with the West. Uh, but if Armenia wants to shift uh, uh, its foreign policy and align itself and embed with the NATO side, um, well, the result for it, it will be that Armenia will lose more, more territories to Azerbaijan, which has a superior army, which is uh, a very rich country. And uh, most of the countries, including Russia and the West, are um, in a honeymoon uh, with uh, with Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan played very smart in the past decade one and two, and it diversified uh, the relationship between the East and West, and now everybody is uh, wanting to pursue good relationship with Azerbaijan, while uh, Armenia is antagonizing Russia in the Southern Caucasus, which is a sphere of influence for Russia. And let's remember that both Azerbaijan and Armenia, they were uh, formerly Soviet uh, countries. So uh, I think the smart thing to do here for Armenia is to diversify its relationship instead of becoming a pawn for NATO, which uh, the experience in Ukraine proved that uh, NATO uh, is ready to use Armenia uh, just like they use the Ukrainians to the last standing person there in order to fight against the uh, uh, Russian Federation. And this is quite clear to me because 
the goal of Pashinyan government is to kick uh, the Russian uh, forces out of uh, Armenia because they have a military base there, and also uh, the peacekeeping forces who are standing between Azerbaijan and uh, and the Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh, where Azerbaijan wants to ethnically cleanse the 120,000 Armenians in uh, Karabakh who are trapped now in this uh, um, independent region. And uh, Azerbaijan basically blocked the only life route uh, for the Nagorno Karabakh, which is called Lachin Corridor. And by doing so, uh, the people there, 120,000 people, are starving, and nobody is able to um, to lift this uh, blockade on, on the Armenians there. But I would say, if the Armenian government isn't trying to help the Armenians of Karabakh and isn't uh, pursuing uh, the foreign policy that can serve the interests of the Armenians there, the in my opinion, the only one. The, the only side that Armenians should point fingers and blame now is the Pashinian government. Um, and so, I mean, uh, it'd be a bit of a grim uh, look into the future, but uh, is it your opinion that, that if things uh, continue the way they're going, we could see uh, a Ukraine-like situation happening there? I think uh, the Russians have excessive power in uh, Southern Caucasus. I think the Russians do not need Armenia as a, an ally country now because they uh, they have a very strong partner now in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is able to um, to present and and um, the national security uh, uh, to give national security guarantees for for Russia and also the interests of Russia in the region. Armenia is sandwiched between Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey, and at the same time, uh, uh, Armenia is pursuing and an, uh, let's say hostile policy toward Russia. So what could go wrong, right? In my opinion. Uh, if the Russians uh, withdraw their heads from the Armenian file, we will see that uh, Armenians will be swallowed by uh, by Turkey and Azerbaijan. They are the weaker side in this equation, and no side, not even NATO, not uh, uh, even Russia, are willing to intervene because um, you have to help yourself because, uh, before others come and help you. And the current policy in, in Yerevan is shooting themselves in the leg, and therefore um, there could be the scenario of Ukraine, but I don't think the Russians are even interested in intervening militarily to secure their uh, interest there, because one, they have already secured their interest through Azerbaijan, and two, uh, Iran is the only party there who is willing and declaring that they want to intervene militarily if Azerbaijan tries to change the borders uh, between Armenia and Iran, because the Azerbaijani demand is to open a new trade route uh, on the borders be be between the borders of uh, um, Armenia and Iran, and by doing so, they will uh, seal the borders between Armenia and Iran. So it's in, now it's in Iran's interest to intervene there and not in Russia's. Oh, okay, and uh, thinking back to the map, then uh, between uh, Armenia and Russia, of course, is Georgia. We they, we had the incident in two thousand and eight in uh, in northern Georgia. I mean, where does where does Georgia sit in this whole uh, situation? Georgia is mostly aligned with the uh, Western Bloc uh, in this, and they don't have good relationship uh, with Armenia for a very long time. But uh, uh, now the current uh, situation in Georgia is similar to the, uh, to the situation uh, in Armenia. And uh, all in all, this uh, Eastern European bloc, especially in Georgia and Armenia, the, uh, the current uh, Armenian leadership, they are increasingly and uh, let's say rapidly but surely aligning themselves with the Western interests. And this is harming their own, uh, uh, in my opinion, their interests, because this country is positions, geographically speaking, is uh, either in the South Caucasus or in Eastern Europe. And this is the um, the uh, the background or the playground of uh, Russia there. And uh, if, if uh, both uh, Armenia and Georgia want to continue in their current path, I think we will see more destabilization in the region because uh, the security, they will need a new security architecture there. They will need a new reformation of their uh, armies, their security apparatuses, if they want to um, move toward the West. This is not something that could be done in a day or two. These countries and the people in these countries must understand that the, the geography uh, plays a role 
politics plays a role and also the social uh, um, uh, let's say the societies in these countries play a role and if you see uh, these two countries georgia and armenia naturally speaking these countries should revolve in the orbit of russia and at the same time have good relationship with the west so if any of these countries uh, become a power to any of the superpowers then uh, there will be a destabilization and there will be an attempt to use these countries against the other superpower and uh, armenia for a very long time played smart and they were strategically aligned with uh, russia and in to the, uh, until 2018, only in 2018, when Pashinyan came to power, he um, uh, eliminated all the pro-Russian officers, generals from from the army, from the security apparatuses, and exposed its national security to uh, Azerbaijan. So when Azerbaijan attacked Armenia or Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020, and recently also on Armenia, the Russian side didn't come for a help because uh, the Russian side knows that Pashinyan is trying to trap Russia also into conflict in the Southern Caucasus in order to make Russia busy on two military fronts and not only in Ukraine, which is the uh, American demand from Pashinyan to drag Russia into another bloody conflict, but this time in the Southern Caucasus. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kavork. We will talk more about that later as well. Uh, but in the meantime, then, Vanessa, let's come to the other uh, front with Russia, perhaps, uh, with Syria. Yeah, um, just a very quick report today to point out. We talked about the three Republican congressmen that entered Syria illegally, of course, through a crossing that is manned by terrorist groups that are actually under sanctions by the Biden administration. And so very recently, we also talked about the unrest in the Northeast, the U.S.-occupied zone, um, where, of course, on an almost daily basis, the U.S. is stealing uh, Syria's oil. Uh, U.S. officials visit Syria's Dar al Dur and bid to defuse the Arab tribal unrest. The Arab tribes have effectively risen up against the Kurdish separatist occupation of the Northeast. So uh, very familiar to see a U.S. delegation appear in the Northeast to try and uh, settle the situation down. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Syria, Ethan Goldrich, and Major General Joel B. Val uh, head the alleged coalition against Islamic State. Of course, as I constantly explain, ISIS is nothing more than another proxy of the United States inside Syria and Iraq. Um, they met with Arab tribal leaders and the Kurdish uh, Contra commanders and agreed to address local grievances and de-escalate violence as soon as possible and avoid casualties. The State Department said, of course, it's not their place to enter northeast Syria, um, as uh, Syrian officials also condemned U.S. delegations' legal visits to northeastern Syria, um, because, of course, it, it um, violates the country's sovereignty and state integrity. But the U.S. has consistently done that um, since 2011. Syria, uh, according to a statement put out by Foreign Minister uh, Faisal Muqtad, support the Arab tribesmen in their battle against the Kurdish Contras because, of course, they perceived this as an opportunity to uproot the Kurdish Contras from the northeast. During this period, the U.S. occupation forces looted and smuggled more Syrian resources to their bases in Iraqi territory, taking out a load of about 95 tankers of oil from the Al Jazeera fields during the past 24 hours, so the theft continues um, moving on. <clears throat> and the clashes renew between the US-backed proxy, so-called rebel tribes, the Kurdish countries uh, in northeast Syria, and um, the, the Arab tribes them, themselves, as we mentioned. But then I want to quickly look at the map of Syria, and I'm sure Kivot will, will comment on this. Going from west and then going around it as a clock, we had two Israeli attacks in the last two days um, during the afternoon, actually, which is fairly unusual, followed by another one. So first of all was to southern Tartus to, to a military base there, which killed two Syrian Arab army soldiers and injured others. The missiles were fired from international waters to the west in the Mediterranean uh, off the coast of Syria, and then from northern Lebanon, they targeted southern Hama, uh, the, the second area that you can see. Now, of course, these two attacks are um, 
have two uh, reasons. One is to create a gap in the Syrian air defense capability to enable Israel, as it perceives, to target what they consider to be the strategic development centers inside Syria, developing both defensive and offensive weapon capability. But at the same time, if you look at the area in Idlib, which is occupied by al-Qaeda and its various affiliates, um, you will see that there has been an increase in military activity to the west of Aleppo, um, to the south of Idlib and the north of Hamal, and to the north of Latakia. So the Israeli attacks never are coincidental. They often come in tandem with uh, either advance by the Syrian Arab army against terrorist positions or attacks by the terrorists against Syrian Arab army positions. Then if you uh, go around the map, I've, I've mentioned before, there are at the moment what the U.S. cartel is trying to achieve, of course, is a, is a shrinking Syrian central state. So the northern areas are controlled by uh, U.S. proxies, the Kurdish Contras, and Turkish proxies, which are basically derivatives of the Free Syrian Army, the Muslim Brotherhood extremists. Coming around the map again, uh, you'll see there is all. Um, interesting that the Kurdish Contras currently seem to be withdrawing from this area, from the Derizor area. Um, and then coming down to al Bukamal, which I pointed out quite, quite frequently, um, is the area that the U.S. wants to gain control of because this is the uh, opening for Iraq or the border crossing for Iraq and Iran to send humanitarian relief into Syria. So I've drawn the yellow line to show where the U.S. wants to gain control to basically close off much of that eastern um, border area because, of course, it has control at al Panaf, its military base, and at Rukban, alleged refugee camp, which is another recruitment center for ISIS and various extremist groups. Then coming to the south, as I've drawn there, the red line showing the areas that are obviously uh, under attack by uh, forces of uh, proxy forces of Israel and the the U.S. alliance, as we've talked about in Sweda and Dara. There have been two assassinations of fairly high-level officials in Dara in the last ten days, and in Sweda, the protests, which are basically sponsored by Israel and the U.S. and power multiplied by Israel and the U.S. and Western media, are continuing. Um, there have been attempts to to take over um, official centers and institutions there in the last few days. So that, I think, just gives you a very quick <laughs> update of what is going on here.